about here with uh, integumentary system is uh, a little bit about homeostatic mechanism and then just a few other things that we kind of say with the integumentary system because again they are both keratinized epithelial cells but that is kind of hair and hair follicles along with nails. Again on either of these I'm not going to go super in depth on them. Just want you to know that both of them are very similar to epithelial cells in that uh, these are keratinized cells that have been pretty much from epithelial cells. Uh, hair, like I said, is a keratinized epithelial cell. Much like the skin, the surface of the hair that you're seeing is dead. There is living cells that are being made at the bottom and that are migrating up. It is definitely a bit tougher than the soft keratin that's in the epidermis. But again, hair, while the hair is not living, the bottom of the hair follicles are. Uh, so this is a picture of a hair follicle. You can kind of see it into the skin here going down. It's lined with epithelial tissue. The living part of the hair is going to be right down here at the base, at the bottom of the hair follicle. This is where those cells are going to grow and divide. And as they more cells divide, it migrates up and that hair is going to get longer. There is some different parts of the the hair called the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. Uh, I'm not too worried that you know which one is which on these ones, just knowing that the hair consists of concentric rings. Uh, again, softer keratin in the inside, harder keratin on the outside of the hair. And this is just kind of showing you these different layers of the hair right here and then the surrounding follicle. Again, not going to ask a lot of questions on this whatsoever. Hair follicles are kind of Interesting, like I said, very similar to nails and skin in the sense that there is growing dividing cells at the bottom and it's these dividing cells that push on the cells above them that are going to be causing this new skin to get replaced in the skin or causing the hair to get longer in the hair. Uh, so much like that, these mitotic cells are in that kind of the same idea that stratum basale of the hair called the hair matrix. Uh, all the cells that are going to become hair start out here. And we're going to see there's good blood supply and stuff to those cells at the base of these hair follicles. And you can kind of see the hair follicle right here. These would be the growing dividing cells right down here. Hair follicles on the base of them are surrounded by a nerve that surrounds that. So if you've ever kind of felt something crawl on your arm or something else like that with the arm hair, each of those hairs do have a sensory kind of plexus surrounding the bottom of that. Part of the reason it hurts when your hair is pulled. Uh, the other thing with our hair is we do have little muscles that are smooth muscle attached to each hair follicle. These are called erector pili muscles. Uh, if you've ever had goosebumps, that is erector pili muscles. It is somewhat of a stygial organ in us. Uh, generally, if you look at the animal kingdom, if you see cats like arch their back or dogs' hair stand up on their back, both these things make an animal look larger. And that is honestly a way to avoid a fight, is to look bigger than your opponent. Uh, humans, they're not capable of doing this with hair anymore. We don't have enough hair. Also, if you've ever seen an animal kind of fluff up their fur and then have it lay back down, it can trap air within that, which can help with insulation, uh, which is part of the reason if you get upset or excited or cold, you will get goosebumps similar to what other mammals would do on that. Again, more vestigial in humans on that. And you can just kind of see it in the picture right here. It is that smooth muscle attached to the hair follicle that will make it stand up on end. Nails are a lot like hair. Again, slightly different type of keratin. They protect the ends of our fingertips. Uh, can insist in grasping things as well as protection. Again, I'm not so worried that you know all the different parts of it, but again, actively growing part of it is near the base of the nail. Uh, that's the nail matrix, very much like the hair matrix, and it's that growing and dividing that's going to push up and allow those nails to get longer. And you can kind of see that right here. The nail matrix is what is making new cells that are going to continue out to the end of this nail. Uh, again, the cuticle is some of the skin that kind of covers the edge of those nails. Again, I'm not too worried that you know about the structures of the nails. We are not going to do any questions with this stuff on the test. So the last really major thing to kind of talk about in terms of super big ideas here is the idea of thermoregulation. This is the main homeostatic mechanism 
within the integumentary system. So you can kind of see here, normal body temp should be about that 98.6. If temperature gets a little too high, we can see that would be the stimulus. The receptors in the skin are gonna recognize this, send that to the control center of the brain saying, okay, we're getting a little too hot. That's gonna send a message out to the effectors of the skin. So the dermal blood vessels will dilate, sweat glands will secrete sweat. Uh, that is gonna cause heat to be lost through the evaporation of that sweat and be lost out of the body, which will help bring that back into the normal range. Uh, the other direction, if we get too cold, again, can send messages to that control center in the brain. We would then constrict those blood vessels, keep it away from the surface of the skin. We can also send messages to the muscles and cause them to shiver, which would generate heat, which again could bring you back in this direction into your normal range. That is kind of that basic thermoregulatory system we have set up and again the main homeostatic mechanism we talk about in the integumentary system and pretty simple one to start out with here as we get through some of these you'll see they do get a little bit more complex hyperthermia is this idea of having too high of a body temperature hypothermia again the opposite of that that is lower than normal body temperature in either of these you get too far out of range can be deadly so the last stuff to talk about with the skin is really about kind of damage to it and how it heals as well as kind of how we talk about some different types of burns and what that means to damage of the skin. So skin healing, inflammation can be a part of this, then forming a scab, having cells go in there, migrate underneath, and we'll kind of see in each of these ones. So, and again, just having a basic understanding of this is really what I'm looking for. I'm not going to have... I'm not going to give you an essay that says, give me the different steps of wound healing. But generally, if you damage the integumentary system, you're going to get bleeding at that one. If you're down into the dermis, it will trigger an inflammatory response, which will cause uh, immune cells like macrophages to go into there. You'll also get fibroblasts migrating in there to help start uh, fixing and putting in connective tissue again. Overall, this clotting of the blood is going to form this scab, this protective surface, which is going to kind of seal the internal from the external of the body. As this injury is healed more, the scab will continue to be undermined by epithelial cells migrating underneath that and putting in new skin underneath that scab. And then again, working that way up to the surface. After several weeks, you will have that scab lost and you will maybe have a little depression of that injury site. If there was enough damage, you may have some permanent scar tissue in there that will stay present. The other thing to kind of talk about with skins is skin is burns. Uh, again, a number of things can cause burn, a lot of heat. Actually, cold can do this as well. Uh, can be a lot of trouble if large enough areas burn, you can die from fluid loss or it again provides a big opening for infections. But what a lot of times they talk about with burns is first, second, and third degree burns and what we're going to do is walk through each of these a little bit. So first degree burns are what we refer to as partial thickness burns. So something like a sunburn, which is a light radiation burn. This is partial thickness. It's going through that epithelium, maybe a little bit into the dermis, but not super deep. So first degree burn would be that very surface zone, the, the burn not getting very deep into this tissue. Second degree burns, they're gonna be, again, still partial thickness, but now deeper down into that dermis. Uh, these tend to be some of the most painful burns. So you can see a second degree burn right here. It usually leads to blistering and opening of that tissue up, where a first degree burn, you generally won't see that. Full thickness burns are these third degree burns, and don't worry, it's not a really scary picture, but this is one that generally, in these areas, are not painful where the third degree burn is because you've actually burnt the nerve endings away. But this would be getting rid of both all the dermis and epidermis. Uh, again, these third degree burns, they are going all the way through. A lot of times to heal these, you're gonna need skin grafting and other things like that to replace that tissue uh, because it's not gonna be able to migrate back into those areas where it was damaged. A lot of times when they're talking about burns, they a lot of times will estimate how much of the body was burned. And to do this, they use what's called the rule of nines. And what this is is really kind of every limb or portion is some multiple or divisor of nine. 
So the front of your arms may be 4.5% of your body area. The back of your arms are 4.5%, so your arms all together are 9. Uh, you can see front of the legs, 9. Back of the legs, 9. If you add all these up, that gets you to 99. And the 1% is that peri perineum, which, again, kind of the genital area there, which, obviously, if you were burnt over a lot of your body one of the years, you're not going to want to be burned. But uh, it kind of gives you the idea of these rules of nines and how they come up with these different terms of how much you've been burnt. So, and then our very last thing to talk about is just kind of some of those things when uh, cell division in skin becomes abnormal, you can get skin cancer. Uh, it's probably one of the more serious things that can happen with the integumentary system in terms of abnormal uh, diseases of the skin. You can see that there's three main basic types of cancers of the skin. You have what's called basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and malignant melanoma. So we can kind of see a picture of each of these ones. The main thing with melanoma to notice is that it is actually uh, cancer of melanocytes. So basal cell carcinoma, this one is usually the least dangerous. Can, and that's one of the nice things about the skin. Even if it's in a slightly bigger area, a lot of times you can surgically excise this pretty easily. Uh, and once you remove those damaged cells, they're pretty much usually gone. So it's one of the ways if you can catch it early enough and excise it before it spreads, it's actually very, uh, skin cancers can be very treatable. Uh, but uh, basal cell carcinoma is just a slightly uncontrolled growth of that stratum basale and just over, ex over proliferation of those cells. Uh, again, a lot of times due to sun exposure, so this picture here, it's kind of pointing to that area right there. Squamous cell carcinoma, this is from cells that should not be dividing in that stratum spinosum, now dividing, again, kind of the second most common here. If you catch it early enough, it can be excised or radiated. Uh, this one can be a little bit more dangerous if it does get into the lymphatics. The main thing is, if you see something abnormal like this, get it checked out. And really the last one is malignant melanoma. Uh, definitely the least common, but easily the most dangerous. It tends to metastasize a lot earlier on. This is actually a cancer of melanocytes. A lot of times this will start from an existing mole. And this is the one where they kind of talk about this ABCD rule. That you look for changes in asymmetry of these moles. Uh, it should have a regular border, not bumpy or blobby on the surface. More circular. There's irregularities if there's multiple colors to it. And again, the larger they are, the more dangerous, uh, the more you should be watching these moles. Uh, bigger is definitely not better when it comes to moles on the body.